in the organization of this uh, seminar, and uh, he has worked worked hardly in order to to set this opportunity. I mean, in a few moments, uh, I will I will uh, return on it on the main aim of this kind of uh, I mean events. Let me thank also uh, my good friend and professor uh, Michelangelo Vasta. Uh, as you know, he is in charge on the uh, research uh, area, so he has the responsibility for. Uh, for this university in order to set uh, this, uh, I mean, mission of our university. Um, and first of all, uh, let me thank all of you to be here this afternoon. Um, this is particularly important because even if, I mean, tomorrow afternoon we, will going, we are going to celebrate uh, the PhD students achieved, achieving the uh, uh, and the, the finalization of this uh, this program, each specific program. Um, so tomorrow we will celebrate them. Uh, this afternoon we we are discussing with the PhD students uh, during their uh, I mean respective programs, and with all the the, the members, the colleagues, uh, so our research community. Uh, we have decided to organize uh, uh, this kind of event in our university because, in my view, uh, we have to, uh, I mean, create some occasions like this in order to put in the same room uh, archaeologists uh, with, uh, I mean, uh, life science uh, PhD students and engineers and, uh, and all the disciplines. Um, in this uh, agora, we have to try to discuss and to put together different issues. That is exactly the, uh, the topics uh, uh, Professor Vespignani has proposed to us. Uh, so uh, this is the idea uh, uh, surrounding us, interdisciplinarity, is a topic we are discussing, I don't know, since which year, and uh, uh, we are continuing to discuss. And uh, it is not in question the importance of interdisciplinarity. Everyone is convinced that it is important. What it is important is how to make it possible. Uh, what it is important is how to bridge uh, the rules related with research in every different system. I'm speaking about regulation and how to, to solve it with uh, the idea that interdisciplinarity is relevant, is productive, is fruitful, and, and other things. Because every one of us, and particularly you, uh, we are in search of disruptive findings. We hope to have in this room one of you that is able to disrupt uh, something, to create a disruptive knowledge. Uh, I mean, as a rector, I would so much to have here in this room someone that is able to disrupt a knowledge in a field. It could be a relevant boost for our university. So we have to work on it. And the discussion this afternoon is related to uh, uh, how to create the, I mean, the, the right environment in which this is possible. Which kind of, which kind of mechanisms uh, we have to put in place in order to achieve this goal. Or which are the barriers we could remove and uh, the barriers that is, uh, I mean, quite impossible to, to change. Um, so this is a relevant topic. Some, some months ago, we have had another, I mean, inspiring uh, meeting like this. It was last year uh, in November with Professor Mantovani. And uh, it was, uh, I mean, uh, it was a meeting in which, at the end of the meeting, there was a very, uh, I mean, a very good perception of the of the meeting and the quality of the meeting. So I hope that, and I'm sure about it. Uh, I hope that this afternoon we will have um, 
a meeting in which there is an interaction, um, no formal meeting. So I put away my tie and my jacket, and let's try to, to discuss and, and exchange ideas on the basis of the, the seminar uh, uh, Professor Vespignani will uh, propose us in a few moments. So thank you again to be here. Thank you very much. That's, uh, that would, first of all, to Professor Vassa for the, how to say, extremely detailed presentation of my career, down to the fine print of my uh, H index numbers. Uh, and thank you for, to the rector for, for, how to say, for this kind of uh, uh, introducing uh, uh, a kind of uh, uh, out of the comfort zone uh, uh, atmosphere, uh, so no ties. But um, so what? What I will do is exactly. I will try to talk about. I will try. I will do my best to provide what in the United States we say is my two cents on on interdisciplinarity and why it is important. And I don't find other ways to approach the, this uh, than really looking at a specific uh, area of activities and, and, and give an example through my work of what is the power and the value, the added value of interdisciplinary work. Uh, if you think about the introduction of Professor Basta, you see my career is quite, uh, uh, I would say, uh, unusual. I started as a physicist. I've been training physics, I've been doing material science and computational modeling of materials for about a decade. And then from there I moved to computer science and social networks on the internet. Um, because of that I got interested in computer viruses. And then at a certain point somebody told me, well, but do you think you can apply those ideas to biological viruses? And now it's more than 15 years that I work in, uh, in public health. Well, this is, at this point, there are two options. You can think, OK, Alessandro is a crackpot. And he's completely crazy. Or the other way, there is some big vision behind that. Well, uh, as usual, the things are, are, are in the middle, in the sense that uh, the big vision, you know, if you were, were asking me 15 years ago or 20 years ago what would have been my career, what were the problems I consider important, they were very different. I could not say that I would respond to a pandemic in 2019, 2020. Uh, at the same time, uh, you know, there was this uh, willingness for me to approach certain problems uh, from the perspective of complex systems that are naturally interdisciplinary, and that led me through this circuitous path that, that you, see, you see here. Uh, let me tell you also why public health, because before we dive a little bit into this, uh, let me, uh, how to say, give you the context. I think that public health uh, is probably the battlefield of the big challenges that we have ahead of us. So for sure, if you think about raising inequality, demographic crisis, uh, migration, uh, biodiversity, climate changes, uh, even leaving aside the, the threat of infectious diseases, uh, all those things uh, find an impact in public health. So we die, we are in, uh, there is more sickness, there is uh, inequalities that reverberate immediately in our quality, life quality. And so in a sense, this is the battlefield where we have to challenge those major existential threats. And so it's a field that really needs reinventing itself in a way beyond what we have thought of public health in the past years. 
although it was a very important part, public health has always been important, but now it's even more important. And it's also a field that is reinventing itself because there are technologies and data that were just not available uh, a few years ago. And so, just think about the impact of artificial intelligence, the impact of new digital data streams that they are having on public health. So this is changing completely what we are doing in the field. Well, what happened more specifically in the last 20 years? Well, just imagine uh, the computational power that we have now. So simulating an entire society 20 years ago when I did start to work on computational modeling was a kind of dream. And now we can really do that for 7 billion individuals. Data, well, <clears throat> again, 10 years ago, thinking that we could follow your whereabouts, where you go, where you drink a coffee, for millions of individuals was just a crazy dream. And now it's there. Each one of you lives with this mobile with you that is recording your digital crumbs along the way of your life. And this data can be used. There is an understanding of networks and our way of interconnecting that comes also from complex system that is huge. There is uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning. All those things are changing the way we can do, we can work in public health. And here, I give you a few examples. Just think about what we call phylogenetics, you know, genomic surveillance. We are now, you know, getting in real time where a virus is and we can just sequence in real time. Integration of human mobility data, just don't think about you, but the fact that now we digitalize everything. Every day, you know, millions of people, uh, hundreds of thousands of people from, if you think about Italy, are moving by, by plane, by train, and all that is recorded, all that is actionable in terms of, uh, of modeling. Population census, you know that now we have maps uh, that provides how many individuals live on the, in the entire surface of the world at the resolution of one by one kilometer. And these maps actually are not just because we are going with the old census data to recover those data. So to, 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 with the old census approach, asking people. We ask people, but at the same time, we look at the images captured by satellite about the light emission that we generate. And these, all these kind of sources of data plug into some artificial intelligence algorithms, give you those maps. Just imagine that I have maps of mosquito abundance, the little mosquitoes at the same resolution. You say, they, well, they not, don't have the, 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 the mobile phone. Well, there are other tricks to, 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 to find where those mosquitoes are. This is what we do. This is what, these are our digital traces. This is the city of Paris in, during the night of the music. It's a very popular festival in Paris and each yellow arrow is one citizen going from one place to another. This was planned by the city of Paris to try to understand better how to organize this festival. And then you see the fireworks. Do you have any idea what the firework is? Uh, the firework is people that at that time, this is a quite old map. Uh, this is 2008, so it's more than 10 years old. In the subway, there was no connectivity. And so basically the people were entering a subway station and then they were, you know, catapulted in a way, tele teleported in another uh, subway station. So you see, this is the level of things that we can do. This is more recent. This is the data that we have for the city of Boston. And you see those little dots. These are census tract in the city. You will see the pulse of the city. So during the day, there are places that get bigger and bigger because people go there. And then during night, they become smaller and go to other places. This is the commuting. Is the life pulse of the city. And now you see that there are a number of quantities here. Uh, let me see if I can manage this. Yeah. You see, this is the number of contacts that each individual contacts, uh, the level of commuting, and so on and so forth. You see, this dashed line is the business as usual world, the world before the pandemic. And then, 
Now we can see what happens when the pandemic hit the city. You will see that this is the life pulse of the city, and at a certain point you will see that the light, the life goes out. You see? That's because everybody was at home, you know, stay at home orders, you know, the pandemic put the city to a halt. Well, it's also interesting to see that actually, you know, although the world at a certain point was supposed to go back to normal, all the restrictions were lifted, this is after the first wave, you see that people doesn't go to normal, doesn't go back to their usual behavior. This is what we, for instance, didn't expect that much. Commuting never went back to normal for more than two years. So this is also to see that, in a sense, we can monitor what is the behavioral changes that we have with those data. And then there, are, there are other data. There are what we call the novel digital data streams. What are those? Well, these are really what you do by interacting on, on the digital media. First of all, there are the participatory platforms. So a lot of projects, a lot of things in which we can say, I have the flu, I don't have the flu, I'm sick, I'm bringing my kids to school. I'm, you know, all this data that we can re record. And these are called active data collection in the sense that you can ask people to volunteer to provide their data to science. But then there is a huge amount, really huge amount of data that we get from passive uh, uh, approaches. What is the passive approaches? Well, that you can look at what you write, well, you can, you, scientists, and also obviously the big tech, you can look at what you write on Facebook, what you write on uh, X, uh, former Twitter, or, you know, whatever you use on social media. For the first time, just think about that, that's another dream. You know, 10 years ago, the dream was to monitor and have information on your whereabouts, physical whereabouts, where you were going, the possible co-occurrence of people in a place. Now we don't get there. Now we get into the heads of people. We can see what millions of people think. And that's something completely unprecedented. At the level that you can do this kind of games, this is uh, produced by the University of Vermont. It's called Hedonometer. It measures uh, how much the world is happy. You see, this is Christmas. Everybody is happy. And then this instead was a mass shooting in Vegas. Everybody was very unhappy. How you do that? You collect all the messages that were flowing on Twitter, millions and millions, and they're from social sciences, and you see the first inbreeding. This is made by computer scientists. But then you take an approach that is using psychology to analyze text that provide a, gra a kind of grading of, you know, from happy to unhappy by looking at the words that you use and how they are semantically used in the text. This is something standard in social sciences. And then you can associate basically a level of happiness to the society. And actually you can zoom in specific topics, specific areas. So this is, in a sense, it changes the world. Also because you can use this data, for instance, to understand better how the market will evolve. Because these anticipate markets that are going up or down, and except you can imagine. So there are now some companies that use those data to pro and, and provide those data to people operating on the market. Well, you know, all that, as you see, is changing the way we approach science in general, but public health even more. Perhaps some of you remember a, 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 who is enough old for that, uh, a paper in, uh, I think it was in 2008 or 2009. Uh, it appeared on uh, uh, Wire magazine, that is, in a sense, is the, how to say, the, 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 the manifesto of innovation, no? And the, 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 the main editor uh, wrote a paper that was called The End of Theory. Well, pretty scary, no? Well, he was just saying that uh, the data that we are producing and the machine algorithms uh, that we have 
will basically impact science uh, to this level that we will not need to understand anymore what happens, the mechanism that provides certain outcomes or forecast or uh, projections or analysis. We just take those data, put in the machines, and we will get answers. And we don't care about that, about the reasons, the underlying mechanism. Well, this is, let me say, since we are informal without the tie, that this pissed off a lot of scientists, you can imagine. But actually, there was a poster child to that. It, it was this, uh, this paper by Google Flu, in which Google Flu really acted on this and say, you know, the Center for Disease Control in the United States spends uh, a lot of resources every year to monitor the flu season. They go to doctor, ask if there is a report of a flu case, etc., etc. And the data have to be aggregated statistically, that they are not actually real flu cases. They are influenza-like cases because there is no time to do the, 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 the testing, etc. And they are always one to two weeks late with respect to the real time. So you have always a photo of the situation that is in the past time. Well, the Google people say, why do you have to do that? We have people searching on Google. We look for keywords like flu, cough, uh, influenza, etc. We have a background of signals. Then we train with respect to the previous year's CDC signal, and then we are able to do now casting. In a sense, we can say what is the situation at this very moment, and also by using a few algorithms, it even give you two or three weeks uh, ahead uh, forecast. And it was working beautifully at the, at the beginning. And then this has, how to say, opened the path to many, many, many other approaches. For instance, you can, in the US, there is a system that is really, at this point, is ubiquitous. It's called Open Table. I'm sorry to make advertisement for big companies, but it's, you have to call by their names. This is a way that you reserve restaurants. There is no way that you reserve a restaurant by phone at this point in the US. Well, you can look at the flu season by just monitoring the last minute cancellation of reservation. So things like that, you know, you open a new era for waiting and looking at data, even in public health. These are not data collected for public health. Well, you know, now we are not thinking more in terms of data, but we are thinking more in terms of machine learning. So the power, you know, the narrative shifted from uh, this is because of a lot of data, more to the fact that we have algorithms that take those data and identify patterns. And the problem is still, however, that we do not understand the underlying mechanism. So in a sense, uh, still uh, that manifest on wired is, is, would be there. We are not understanding. It's a black box, the famous black box, uh, you know, issue that we have with artificial intelligence. Well, and here, you, however, some philosopher and uh, philosopher of science would mention to you the Polanyi paradox uh, to say, who cares about the fact that we don't have uh, this mechanism? Do you know what is the Polanyi paradox? Uh, so, have you ever, so uh, let's imagine that you want to teach somebody to ride a bicycle. What do you do? Well, a physicist, I should answer, well, I start at the whiteboard or the blackboard and write all the equations of the radius of generation, momentum, torsion, etc., etc. Will you ever do that? No. And actually, no one knows the equations that governs the bicycle movement, even physicists, by the way. It's very complex. It's a very complex uh, task. So what do you do? You take your kid, your little kid put on the bike and push down, you know, hoping that it doesn't uh, hurt himself or herself. Why is that? And you will tell something like, uh, you have to pedal, you have to go fast because then there is more stability. And in a sense, you are not teaching anything. So you are able to ride a bike, but you don't know why. And so this is called tacit knowledge. And what is the difference from machine learning? The machine knows the answer. It's just not able to explain. Is that enough for us? 
Well, no, here there is a problem, and you, you see that more and more disciplines enter into it. First of all, well, mm, we have understood during the pandemic that we need more than this black box effect, because I want to know what is the transmissibility of the disease. I want to know if the vaccine are working or not. I want to know what are the causes and the mechanism that give rise to certain events. There is also the issue that data are biased. In machine learning and machine intelligence, often you have an equation, more data, better prediction. Ah, in some areas where we are involved, this is not the case. And even in public health, if you think, if I have data of 20 years ago, they are not improving my, my prediction. Actually, they are talking about a system that is not the actual one, so actually could destroy my prediction. And then there is something else where it, physics comes along. Is, you can look at, at this paper. It's the Poincaré recurrence theorem, something that seems very obscure. It's math and physics that tell us that if you want to have forecast, you have to have the right low dimensional projection of the system. I don't want to be technical, but this is something that tells you that if you are using the wrong variables, uh, sooner or later you are going to end in troubles. And so you see, that's where we have to do more. We have to use the machine learning, we have to use this power, because it's great, but we have to be very careful. And indeed, Google flu trend collapsed. <laughs> in 2013, collapsed. It started to have 100% magnitude errors. And you know, nobody, even the Google engineers, actually understood why. There are several theories. One of those is that actually even information technology is alive. Google is not always the same stuff. If you remember, around that years, Google started to suggest what you have to search. You start typing a word, but then Google starts to autofill what you should search. This changed completely the dynamic of the engine, of the search engine. All the training of the machine learning probably collapsed because of that. So you see, this is a way to say, well, we need a more all hands on deck uh, things. And this is, I'm not saying that Google Flu Trend was not a success. It's a very paradigmatic story that used and introduced us to the power of machine learning, to the fact that we cannot rely on a single data source, and that we have to be mindful of all those problems with machine learning and machine intelligence. So it's very powerful, and we can use it now. And so you see computer scientists, public health people, social scientists, all at once working on a problem. Well, then there are situations like COVID in which we want to do more. We really want to have an understanding of those mechanisms. We want to understand why things happen. We are not satisfied by just by looking at what is the situation now. So what we want is actionable modeling. This is what public health should be. And when I think about public health, uh, 2.0, I mean to go from those kind of statistical analysis to something like what we do with weather forecast. Projecting trajectories, having very well-defined confidence interval, understanding the mechanism, the mechanism underlying those, those trajectories. Well, to do that, we need to start from here, from us. And this is again where somebody as a physicist like me has to go to social scientists. Because what we have to do is to build those social networks. So you see here you have people. These are associated to households. And what we do is to identify individuals with other places, like schools, workplaces, general community, when you go to a coffee place, a restaurant, a market. And then you create what we call those bipartite networks, individuals and co-occurrences in places. Well, what happens here? That if you want to understand how a disease spread, this is where the disease spread, where you are in the same place. And so what you do is that then you do something that mathematically is called a unipartite projection, 
and you connect all the people who spend time together in a place. You create a huge network that actually is the fabric of our society. It's invisible, but we all have a network constantly moving around us of people that we are in contact with. And this is what we need to map to create those mechanism understanding and those forecast and projection that we need, for instance, to have, how to say, the power to see behind today and in, look into the tomorrow of the disease. Well, this seems a very nice program, and you say, well, yes, you can do that, but this is blood and tears, because actually what you have to do is to start with the social scientist, start from microcensus data, which maps exactly with very high details single households, then map into the local uh, socio-demographic uh, statistics of each place and then create those network you see order by what we call layer these are multi-layer network the household the workplace the school the environment etc etc and then we can create artificial societies which are also respectful of your privacy in the sense that those individuals are no individuals is identical to all of you, but all the statistical properties of the society are identical to the actual society, down to the level of the one by one kilometer in a sense. And then you can also do all the coarse graining you want, so you can also you simplified version depending on the data that you have. For instance, this is what generally are used to, to, to describe disease spreading. It's called the contact matrix by age. So what is the probability that a five years old is in contact with a five years old, with a 10 years old, and so on and so forth? Because those contacts are different. Again, we are looking at a fabric of society, but we are projecting on the dimension, on one dimension that is the age of the individuals. Well, this is a lot of work that has to be connected. Those networks are connected with other networks, like your commuting patterns, the mobility that we were looking we were looking in those beautiful videos before. And then this has also to be connected with another layer of mobility that is the long distance layer. So how we go from one country to another, how we go from uh, one city to another by using uh, trains, uh, uh, airlines, and so on and so forth. Well, all that is possible now, and you can generate models uh, where you have causal mechanism built in for the transmission of the disease, where you layer all that information to create those artificial societies, and you can have also, as it is in weather forecasts, for instance, for different resolution, different approaches, because if you want to have forecast at the global level, you will use specific uh, theoretical approaches, while if you want to know everything about a city, you will know to know very clearly what happens on each layer of that society. And you say, this can be done. Yes, can be done. It's very difficult. And here we have to bring another scientific discipline. This is computer science and engineering. Because if you want to do this work, and this is something that we did during, during the pandemic, well, what you are handling are things like that. You know, each analysis, each model campaign that has to be done every week or every few days is terabyte and terabyte of data. Millions and millions of realization of those epidemics stochastically, as we say, because you have a lot of uncertainty to handle. And you need to do this in major supercomputing infrastructure. All that cannot be done if you don't have computer scientists working with you. And so this is another place where, you know, science and other disciplines has to enter the, uh, the game. And at the end, what you do is this one. This is, for instance, is one of the realization that tells you, you see, each of these little white dots is a single individual traveling on a single airline connection across the world to map human mobility and how a disease spread across the world. Each of the white dots is a carrier of the disease. This is a single instance. 
And now imagine we have to reproduce millions of those single instances and then aggregate statistically in order to have the confidence interval and the statistical uncertainty factored in whatever forecast you do or analysis you do. And here again, just to give you an example, is what, although people were not remembering and then there has been a lot of, how to say, storms about what was the power of uh, uh, forecasting and, and scenario projections for diseases. Actually, in February, those models were already telling that the transmission of COVID was completely out of control. This has been all communicated to agencies because those models were, for instance, telling, look, very likely you have all already, this is the probability, local transmission in the US in January and early February. And this is also the map of where the introduction were coming from. So this is, was actionable things that have been provided to policymakers. And then I should open another discussion and we can talk another five hours of why this has not been uh, probably digested uh, in, uh, in our response of COVID. I will try probably in 10 minutes to say something about that tomorrow. Well. This is also factored, for instance, uh, in understanding what happens when you introduce a new variant. This is the introduction of the alpha variant in the United States. And you see that there is a lot of heterogeneity that then you can compare, and here comes another scientific discipline, microbiology. These are genomic sequences of the viruses so that you can look at how the evolution of the virus is changing the epidemiological landscape. And you can match with the data coming from those simulation of mobility in order to get a real-time understanding of how the disease is spreading and how the epidemi epidemic properties of the disease are changing. So this is all possible, and this is also possible in a way that probably has not been advertised during the pandemic, advertised, communicated. I'm sorry for the bad word. And this is another area of science that is extremely important, that is communication. You probably have seen a lot of people writing entire pages of newspapers with their own prediction, with their own model. You don't do that. When you want to have a weather forecast, you don't go to one single individual and tell him, please, drop to do what you're doing and, and, and do a weather forecast. You go to the National Weather Service. Why? Because the National Weather Service doesn't use one model, one team. It uses what they are called ensemble prediction. It's consensus from the community. And this has been done, but obviously it's more difficult to communicate to the public. It's easier to go for the, how to say, the newspaper to go to one individual and say, what do you think tomorrow? And he will tell you what he thinks to, uh, it will happen tomorrow. Then go into, for instance, as we did, to the Center for Disease Control that tells, uh, I'm telling you what is going to happen tomorrow. But this is the complicated sum of many things, different models, uh, consensus process, etc., etc. But this is there. It's out there. And this is where we need to build those national infectious disease threat observatories. In the United States, we just were able to push to create the first national network for infectious disease forecast with an investment of hundreds of millions of dollars, like the National Weather Service. It was not there. It was, the wheel was, in a sense, invented during the pandemic, but now it's possible. My thing is that well, we need to do that in each country of the world, like every country in the world has a national weather service. And they should also be used not only for infectious disease or pandemic, but for public health in general. To reinvent this public health through an interdisciplinary effort. There is no computer science, there is no epidemiologist, there is no medical doctor, there is the community, the scientific community as a whole that looks at, uh, existential, at an existential threat with all the weapons we can throw at the enemy. Well, and here I'm diving into the last part of the talk. A pandemic or public health is a more difficult problem than weather, than weather forecast. 
weather forecast. When we predict uh, the pattern of a hurricane, the hurricane doesn't care about our prediction. Society, unfortunately, unfortunately, fortunately, will ingest the information and will act upon that information. So in a sense, this is great. If we open the umbrella during the hurricane, we cannot change the trajectory. If we do interventions toward the pandemic, we change the trajectory. And so this makes predicting and projecting and having scenarios of a pandemic or an infectious disease threat or a public health problem much more slippery. Because generally you predict things, then you act upon those vision, and then the things changes. In a sense, you produce map of the future, and then you try to direct the system toward a specific area of those map of the future. And this is something that is very important, but the people, we are in the loop. And so what is becomes incredibly important is behavioral sciences, is economics. We have to bring those scientific disciplines on board. We need to have, you know, economics because our choices are always a trade-off. We have to bring social behavior because we are, unfortunately, pretty much irrational in many things we do. And so, you know, we need to map what is our behavior. And this is uh, an example that we can do that. This is a map of all the tweets that people were exchanging before the protest of the 15th of May in Spain. You see that at a certain point there was this starting of messages and at a certain point this outburst in Madrid that transformed in a physical protest. So you see that actually we can understand much more about the people by looking at our digital crimes that I was mentioning before. Again, we are talking about taking the metaphor of contagion that we are so used in infectious diseases and transform as a metaphor, as a mathematics, as a science of social contagion. And social contagion doesn't occur in the physical space. It doesn't occur just when we are in the same place. It happens also on the media. It happens on social network. It happens over the phone. And so we have a different world. This is, for instance, is an experiment in which we are mapping how a specific piece of information travel into groups of a scientific community. This is uh, IEEE working groups, etc. And you see that actually there are specific thresholds. If the communication is not enough, the information is not able to penetrate the system. If it's the interaction is good enough, the information is able to penetrate the system. And now we are talking about information, about an idea. We are not talking about a disease, a, a pathogen. Well, we can do that. Now we have the scientific tools that bring us into this area. And for instance, allow us to map polarization. These are all messages that are exchanged concerning uh, keywords uh, on, again, on uh, former uh, Twitter platform that uh, has a uh, major uh, identifier uh, GOP and Democratic Party in, uh, in the US. And you see immediately what happens, that the system splits in two bubbles. One is the Democratic and the other one is the Republican part, with very little connection in between. So you see, you, we go into mapping and try to understand how communication led us there, or perhaps how communication was always like that, but is driven by that. If we understand that, we can understand how we behave better and then perhaps close the loop. So this is also why it's important, because during the pandemic we all learn about you know, the, how great is the digital age and we have information at our fingertips. But then at the same time, we have also understood how much is easy, easy to spread misinformation. Misinformation was always spread, and not just on social network, but on social network is a little faster, and probably the outreach is larger. So, but it, 
this misinformation or disinformation had a huge impact on the way that we behaved and on the way that we change our, how to say, approach and response to the pandemic and so to the public health outcome. So understanding that becomes really extremely, extremely important. Well, if we want to summarize, you know, this is really new technology, an interdisciplinary approach. You have seen it's an all hands on deck. There is no problem like this one that can be approached by being only a social scientist, by being only a computer scientist, uh, only a physicist a biologist. We have to have this all hands on deck approach in which we have to interact and we have to learn new things, new point of views, new approaches. But this is changing the way that we are going to face those major challenges and really creating uh, uh, advances also in area like, you know, what we call science of science, how we do science, how we understand the process of spreading of uh, knowledge and ideas. So this is really going to transform the world more and more, especially now that basically computer power start to be close to limitless in a way. Just to give you an example, for me, I, in my junior years when I was working on, on, on computing in material science, uh, we were using uh, a single computer or, or a supercomputer and having uh, 100 processors doing a calculation at once was incredible. To do that uh, pandemic work that we did, we were working on, uh, on cloud computing. Uh, with 160,000 CPU running in parallel, so 160,000 routinely. This is the general work. And we could have gone to 300,000. It's just a matter of cost. It's just a matter of resources. Well, and this is the point for people who are getting a PhD now, you know. In a sense, a PhD, <coughs> is a training in curiosity. I think if I have to explain the first slide that circuitous part of mine in science is because I was curious. I was going from topic to topic with a, with a specific perhaps obsession of mine that was understanding this idea of spreading that was first in physics, then in material science, then in computer science, and then in biology. But you know, in a sense, as a PhD, uh, this training should not leave any question unasked, because it's a missed opportunity. The other thing is that really, the modern challenges do not have boundaries. And so, we, as scientists, should not have boundaries. Saying and declaring, I'm a economist, I'm a physicist, I'm an epidemiologist, is already limiting yourself. The other thing is that really, if you think about where is the gold mine for us, where, where is the gold mine? Is that the intersection of those disciplines? This is where is the unknown. And this is where we can have an impact. And so this is where I would like to see my PhD students go in the future, goes in that uncharted area. However, with a sense of uh, being, being uh, humble. Why? Because every time that you go into those uncharted territory and in an area that is not yours, you have to be approaching uh, in an humble way, being ready to learn again. And that's the other things. A PhD is not a terminal degree, as they always say. Unfortunately, we always say, this, even in the US, the PhD is a terminal degree. Actually, it's the starting degree for approaching problems wherever they are. So you have to embrace lifelong learning. And believe me, this is the only thing that I can bring is fun. For me, learning how to write a paper in 
computer science or public health after I learned many, many years ago how to write a paper in physics was illuminating. I understood different way of thinking. And then let's not, I can start. I, in physics, we think we know statistics. It's not true. <laughs> for reasons I could go for a long time. Like in economics, they know how to do forecast. It's not that true. <laughs> and you know how in epidemiology you think that you know everything about a disease. No, far from true, and so on and so forth. So we can have this lifelong learning. Well, there is one thing, however, now I want to close with my humbleness, in a sense, by being humble. Everything I say always has the survival bias. You know what is the survival bias? It's somebody who comes to you and tells you a kind of recipe to be successful or to be impactful. And then, of course, they can tell you that because probably they have been impactful in a way. But in many cases, it's just by chance. Or in many cases, it's telling you a story that could be completely, you know, misleading. So, you know, always take whatever person will tell you on a podium, in a sense, with a grain of salt, because it's telling you something that comes from an experience that is one story, while there could be many. But in that many, you have to find yours. In that many possible stories. I'm not saying that you are, you must be compulsive in going around from shop to shop of science doing different things. You might be laser focused, but at the same time you can really broad and you can give a hands to, to interdisciplinarity. The important point is that really you, you approach the, 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 you know, in a way with uh, finding, a, here I use the word passion, but I would say your obsession. You know that the, the inventor of Atari, one of the first uh, microcomputers, you probably are too young to remember, but some of you probably remember what was Atari. Actually, I remember even things like a machine that was called ZX Spectrum, so perhaps who knows here, so it's too old. But you know, this guy was always saying that, you know, everybody in life, sooner or later, when he's taking a shower, has a great idea and think of a great solution or a great problem. The difference is that 99.99% .99 of the people goes out of the shower, dry themselves, and don't think about that idea anymore. So the difference is really to have that idea, to have that challenge, to have that vision, and make it your obsession. Then I think you will be successful. And this is what a PhD actually is called to do because we talk a lot about artificial intelligence, but you are the intelligence of the world. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Professor Espignani, for your brilliant lecture. I'm pretty sure that uh, we have questions from the floor, from students, hopefully. I'm a student. Okay. <laughs> okay. If you can say your name just uh, and yes. your field, uh, probably it's uh, interesting. Yes, I'm Mattia Guidi. I'm an associate professor of political science uh, here at the University of Siena. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, presentation and speech. It was really uh, very, very interesting. I had a, a thought about the issue of privacy because you talked about uh, much, ma many data that today can be gathered from our cell phones, for example. And the thing is that there seems to be uh, a trade-off. So you seem to suggest that even though these devices collect data on us, uh, these data collected and treated in a proper way can be useful uh, for, the, for the public good. Do you think there is a point uh, after which this abundance of data collections ceases to be useful 
and becomes just uh, useful to the companies who collect this data. So this is my question. Uh, this is a very, this is an extraordinary good question and bring us in another area that is, uh, is extremely important, that is ethics and, and, and principle in our uh, approach to data and algorithms. Uh, first of all, this is great that comes from a political scientist and I didn't mention explicitly political scientist, for instance, is a big component of, of the work also in, in pandemic response. Political science was crucial to understand a lot of things related to, as you can imagine, the interaction of politics and social behavior and view of the pandemic. So you, many of the things that have happened actually were driven by politics. So that's just to say something that the, the importance of the, the area, the discipline. I think, you know, this is, is going to open a major, uh, major problem. First of all, data, there is no way to stop data collection. This is something that uh, we are doing, uh, big tech are doing, uh, everybody's doing because it's valuable on one side, but also it's valuable scientifically. So we cannot surrender and say it's a problem to keep uh, privacy, etc. We need to uh, we need to use those data scientifically. So there is an entire area which is uh, uh, privacy preserving uh, uh, algorithms, uh, uh, which is a major area of computer science just to solve that problem. Then there is the issue of what limit, limits we, we use in terms of what it can be collected, what start to be disruptive at the single individual level. And there we enter into, even into the, the approach that people in, in law and legal uh, uh, studies uh, uh, can say. I want to open one, uh, say something. We often think in terms of data. I, for me now, the, ma the major issue is the ethics uh, and boundaries of algorithms. That is something even more different. In a sense, data is, is raw material is the algorithm itself that is going to act on those data and there the, the, the boundaries are not clear. So now there are wonderful, I say you something simple, there are wonderful algorithms that if you submit a manuscript can tell you if that book will be successful or not according to specific algorithms. Now you see that this is something very, very slippery because if all editors start to use those algorithms, uh, this system becomes a self-fulfilled prophecy. So you just pass the manuscript that the algorithm say yes, so the manuscript for the algorithm enforces his beliefs and, and so on and so forth. So how we work in this? Because unfortunately those algorithm, algorithms are written, those data exist. We are digitalizing anyway. So this opens immense question, but this is, uh, it's our challenge. We need to, how to say, to govern a revolution, and we need to do that. One way or another, uh, willing or not, we have to do it. There is, and this is the last problem, I think we really need a new infrastructure, a regulatory infrastructure. For instance, now you know that the European Union is having the new regulation for data and privacy, et cetera, et cetera, is reinforcing the, is a, approaching also artificial intelligence regulation, etc. It has been written four years ago. It went through a lot of steps. Then it has been approved that it will be implemented probably in one year because each state has to make that, uh, that, that, that regulation. And so, on. so in that regulation, that seems now we have a regulation for artificial intelligence and data, there is no mention of large language model and generative artificial intelligence. So basically, chat GPT, uh, images, etc., are not even mentioned. But you say, well, Europe did what, this is a kind of perfect uh, case study, could not be faster. So we need to invent new mechanism, even on what we do and how we regulate this world. And this is a scientific challenge where you are all welcome. Are there questions? <laughs> There's a student probably there. Sí, sí. 
Hello, I'm a student from the economics department, and I want to say thank you for your time. And uh, I want to ask about how optimistic are you um, about the about the possibility of overcoming some clim these climate challenges and you know the global warming with some interdisciplinary approaches. Can you can you repeat? Uh, yeah, I want to say like how optimistic are you that uh, these interdisciplinary approaches and like combining different uh, different uh, scientific fields would help us to overcome the challenges related to climate change and you know the well you know global warming. I I think that you know the the, the 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 interdisciplinary approaches and those these approaches are going to be our weapon against. Uh, issues like climate change, uh, climate change etc. Uh, in a way, you see basically now climate change is becoming a, a debate, uh, uh, a public debate very similar, unfortunately, to what has been the public debate for the pandemic. And the only way that we can overcome those problems is really to bring that interdisciplinary and these challenges in the loop. We can know, we, we have to stop uh, thinking by slogan and by disciplinary sectors, uh, in which you say, well, if I think about climate change, I have to think about the economics. Or, no, I think about the weather. No, I think about the politics. No, these things have to be connected. And you need the data to connect those. Now, I can just give you an example, because it's a paper of a few days ago. It's a paper based on data analysis and about the green uh, revolution and the fact that uh, you know there is always a kind of slogan that says uh, and comes from a certain uh, group of uh, economics expert. The green industry, so all the alternative energy, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, will create a number of uh, uh, jobs that is much larger than the number of jobs that you lose by offsetting uh, the industry that uh, has a carbon uh, footprint. This is what we always say, you know? even in our presidential campaigns in the US, you know, we do the Green New Deal and we will generate many more jobs than et cetera. Yes, it's true if you use certain economics uh, uh, approaches. If you look at the data, there is one thing that doesn't come from economics, but comes from social and mobility science. The fact that the jobs are placed in space in a way that is very heterogeneous, as in it's not interchangeable. And so you can create a lot of jobs, uh, which, however, there is a problem, because you cannot fill those jobs, uh, and then you cannot replace the jobs in other places. We can't just think about people like if they are in an abstract place. place. And so you see, this is where data helps you, gives another impact input to economics, gives another way of looking at something that in principle is positive, but then we need to do in the right way. And we can't think just in terms of slogan because we have a single result. And that's also the awareness of complexity of the world that we live in. We are not just you know, in a world that is homogeneous like we do always in theory, where we are rational, we are, et cetera. We are in an heterogeneous world and those comes uh, uh, and surface in all the big challenges. Now I did the climate change, but I can do many, many other examples. Uh, Paolo. <coughs> yes, I have two, two comments. Okay. The first one is on models. and. Uh, S something that uh, I, I tell my students is that even if you have uh, all the data that you, that you want, uh, if you cannot run experiments, you need a model. And, and for example, in the case that you were showing us that the overall activity of people has not yet reached the levels of uh, pre-COVID, you don't know if that's because people have changed their way of thinking or because we are in a different equilibrium. But equilibrium of what? Uh, then, then I guess you need, uh, you need a model for that. First, first comment. <laughs> and second comment, the, the last thing you said about the successful books uh, reminds me a lot of the Black Scholes uh, models in finance. So they invented this model in the 70s to price derivatives, 
that was based on the assumption that investors took decisions independently, but at the time that the first computerized trading happened, all the computers, all the banks were using it, and then you had a crash, that one, that was not possible according to the model. So probably this may happen in some applications. These are two great comments in the sense that uh, we need experiments. Uh, Possibly, you know, the, the pandemic has been called the biggest natural experiment that we, we could do, no? I hopefully we don't have to do pandemic to do experiments, and so we want to have experiments. It's not easy. You probably know, you know, even uh, now the work that has been done with Facebook, uh, you see there have been those incredible things with three science and one nature paper all doing experiments on, on Facebook user, etc. has been criticized a lot. Every time that we do experiments and that you do experiment on social behavior, ugh, it's, it's a problem. I think we need to do the experiment, but we need to go a little far from the academic uh, uh, behavioral experiments that we have done for many years. You know better than me, Paolo, as we have discussed many times, but you know, there is an entire uh, uh, area, entire areas that are based on experiments made on uh, college educated uh, graduate students that volunteer to do experiments uh, with 10 people, 15 people. The world is different than that because otherwise we fall into the usual traps, you know, like the rational behavior, this, this experiment, controlled experiment. We need to do large scale experiment. How to make Make that happen it's a matter again of resources we need to understand the importance of, of those experiments and they are crucial I totally totally agree uh, professor Botta first of all thank you very much for your beautiful presentation actually I'm the first from the life sciences world I'm teaching endocrinology and metabolism and uh, our research focus is on diabetes, which is indeed uh, not uh, an infectious disease. Nevertheless, uh, uh, we know that there is pandemic in terms of diabetes. The trajectory of prevalence of this disease is uh, unbelievably high in the world. Now we have more than 500 million people with uh, diabetes. And the challenge here is to bend the trajectory to some kind of uh, uh, expenses that can be sustained. So on one side, in our field, we have on one side the studies that uh, study the mechanisms at the single molecular level. So we have a wet lab, we have PhD students, PhD students here studying this in a very detailed way. But I think your beautiful presentation also gave us a message that we have to fly high and to have a, a, a vision from very high to see a global phenomenon. And to in this regard, I would like to share with you what, are, what we are finding at the international level. Basically, for many decades, we have been taught that uh, diabetes, especially type 2 diabetes, is um, basically the risk increases with age. So uh, this, was, this is something that we teach to our students, that the older you are, the higher is the risk of diabetes. But then, in the last 10 years, the things change. And uh, this uh, theory was not matching uh, to what was happening, especially in big towns, in metropoles. And uh, with the help of other uh, colleagues far from medicine, we, what we did, uh, we took uh, four or five big towns in the world. One is uh, Rome, the other one is Houston, the other one is Vancouver, and a couple of towns in China. And in particular, what we found in Rome, that uh, if you map diabetes at the single municipality level, you find that age actually is not a determinant of diabetes. The diabetes is, the prevalence is highest where the age is younger, but where social determinants of health are more heavy. In five uh, metro stops, basically you have twice as much risk of diabetes and uh, le uh, life ex expectancy three years less. This is not overall true, because if you rather move from a town to go to Basilicata, which is the region where in Italy has the highest prevalence of diabetes, then we map again at the uh, single municipality level, and then the, the determinant is the genetics. 
basically we collaborated with some anthropologists from Netherlands and uh, we reconstructed the prevalence was uh, basically due so, to some genes belonging to the Norman people that in the Middle Age uh, were in the south of Italy. So uh, in other words, uh, uh, I would like to thank you because you gave a, a wonderful um, demonstration of how the interdisciplinary is an added value and why you have to always to think about uh, different rather than concentrating on one single uh, spot or a single mechanism. Thank you again. Thank you. <laughs> Are there questions, comments? Yes, uh, I'm an associate professor in economics. I have a question on the, well, related to privacy because uh, all the uh, wonderful examples that you were showing uh, are related to data that come from the private sector, merely. A lot of them. During the pandemic, actually, the impression was that it, it is much easier to get data from private companies, on, from mobile telephone. Instead, if you try to get data from the national institutes, if this set of variables identify a group of less than 30 individuals, you cannot have microdata. Well, this contrasts a little bit with, uh, well, the freedom of research, which question you can answer. So I would like to know your opinion on, on that because it's, it's quite a paradox that sometimes it's easier to, to get information from private and from public for, to do public research. I, I, I think we, we touched upon that before. Uh, for sure, you know, I always find a little bit this friction of the end user that is completely considered completely untrustworthy government and then completely trustworthy whatever other big tech company <laughs> gets the data because you know these data are not generated in vacuum these data are generated within big tech company that are using it so why you know immediately if those data goes into into a national observatory for uh, you know for uh, for pandemic prediction that is is is, is spy and, and citizen surveillance while instead you know in a big tech company this is not it's it's a bit strange. At the same time, I understand that we need to be respectful of this. And so there are techniques to avoid that. So one problem for us to work with those data in the past, before the pandemic, was that indeed uh, we were asking companies, uh, the, the big tech companies who acquire, who gather those data, to share those data. But we were not crazy. We know that we cannot get the actual data. We need data which have to be anonymized, that have to be treated statistically, aggregated, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This cannot be done by dumping on us the data, because otherwise there is an issue of the identification, etc. So we were trying to work with the companies, asking them to do that in their own, uh, how to say, uh, walled gardens, uh, so that we could get uh, get just a product that is anonymized. On the other hand, we are not doing prediction on you or her, but we're doing prediction on, on a social aggregate. Well, before the pandemic, the answer was always, yes, but this costs a lot of money. How we do that? You know, and it was always, the, the problem is that governments, grants, uh, funding was not enough to generate this process. So some of the company were willing uh, some of their time, uh, some of their effort, but it was not a big movement. During the pandemic, as you can imagine, at the beginning, everybody wanted to give a hand, uh, how to say, help, uh, at the same time also to do some advertisement to their uh, good citizenship and so they you know for the first time you were talking to companies and they were telling you want 20 engineers to work on that uh, we will do that we will put the computing power and so everything was has been set up now the problem is that the pandemic is over and the companies are going back to the old mode. So who is providing resources for us to have 10 engineers that do those work uh, within the uh, wall gardens of our uh, infrastructure? Now, the problem is to 
tell the governments, the funding agencies, and everybody that if we lose momentum now, the next time we will have to reinvent the wheel, and that we are really losing a train. Also for a reason, because you could say, well, but now you have this pipeline that produced those data, why can't you use those? Because all this platform and how the data are acquired changes day by day, so you always have need of somebody who is within the data acquisition process that is able to generate the right data in the right anonymized way. Then there is a way of communication. You know, we need to communicate with people better and understand that really, while in many cases, you know, people might panic uh, that, that as soon as some, they get some alert or they donate some data, they are donating everything. This is not true. Those are the only, probably the only algorithms that are completely audited that, that are not getting any other data uh, from, from the individuals. While instead, most of the app, app that you download on your phone uh, in the background are taking other data that, <laughs> that, that, that you don't know. So it's a matter of communicating. And this is where I think, again, it's on you, it's on PhD students, it's on faculty, is that the society, we are in a society that is evolving at an incredible pace. We have to provide society of the needed awareness. People is not aware of what is happening, how those mechanisms work, what are the limits, what are the issues. In many cases, there is a use of those technologies that is just like it happens. But then at the same time, they are seen as bad as soon as there is an occasion. So it's really we need to, to work in, 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 in communication. So I think this is the first point. And by the way, let me be, again, to do my humble uh, things. Obviously, I'm, I'm, I'm always asked about privacy, etc. I am not an expert on privacy. Be, 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 be careful. Uh, say, computer scientists uh, that, you, that works on privacy preserving technologies are the expert. And they will tell you that actually there are a lot of ways to do privacy preserving uh, uh, technology. So don't take my word, take their word. So I am a PhD student in economics. First, thank you for your presentation. It was really illuminating in a sense. So my comment uh, is uh, really connected with the last thing uh, you were saying, and that is, uh, um, I often heard uh, the sentence that uh, once you have uh, enough data, you can uh, find evidence of uh, whatever it is your conviction. So um, what do you think uh, is the role of the... Closer the microphone. What do you think is uh, the role of the universities, of the really the educational system in uh, training people to actually handle this uh, new amount of data. For instance, even, uh, I guess, even me, I'm not of, <laughs> I feel like I'm not of a generation which is trained to handle this is huge amount of data and uh, maybe this can lead to potential misuse, uh, wrong results, I, I don't know. You, the question is really, what do you think about the trade-off between training people to use this uh, new am amount of, di of data with respect to the usual way of training uh, in theory, in models, in... Uh, it looks to me th this is a, really a, a breaking point, uh, even in the education. Uh, this is a good question. Uh, what the university sh should do with, with respect to that? I, I, I think there are many things. First of all, university have to be seen as, again, you know, they, for me, the uni, how to say, I think of the world that this global intelligence, you know, that we, that we have and we generate. And university are the, some of the most important uh, places where this intelligence happens, this thinking is happening. And you 
as me, as everybody here, is a neuron of this intelligence in a way. So our role, I think, uh, is to, first of all, to, to be, as I would say, to, to be trained in awareness. Because the way, I, I don't think there is a recipe to say we are not approaching a disruptive point, uh, how we regulate this, as we do this, how we would do that, uh, can we work on this or can we work on We, first of all, everything starts with awareness. By looking, as you were saying, you know, there is issues, uh, or they were saying there are issues with data, what do we do, et cetera. We need, I think, in the university to provide more exposure and this is the interdisciplinary exposure we were talking before. So I think we have to train students to think about their silos and their specialties to see more, you know, what are the potentiality that are out there, you know, the potential that is out there in many areas, as well as we, with the dangers. The other thing is that, again, if you ask me in terms of education and as a, as, as a university, what how we can solve those problem, it, it's a little, we are going to have a major challenge in the education system that I don't wanna, I would say, invest too much the leadership, but this is going to happen. So we are in a world that, that is, has always been changing and the university has been often a lead in these changes, the leader of those changes. If you think about what we were teaching or whatever 100 years ago, 50 years ago, 20 years ago, is very different. And the university was often on top of this. This is leaping away. In many cases, what I see is that now we have a problem in teaching students uh, what is really the last Things. So the, the, the acceleration of, uh, of science and progress is so fast that there is a problem in, uh, in training. Now, how we solve this, I don't know, but obviously poses major question. You know, I can give you an example that is completely, in a sense, outside of my area. But I think for me, if I would be a rector, I would be very worried, not perhaps in this university, but in other universities. So we have uh, uh, extremely good school across the world of people who are interpreters and translators. And we have curricula, we have training, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, now whoever has played with large language models, uh, uh, realizes now that translation are almost perfect. <laughs> and uh, one translator can do the work of 10 translators at this point, if he knows how to interact with those machines. Interpreter, then you talk to interpreter and say, well, but we are safe because we do the direct interpretation. Well, believe me, this is, down the road, in a short time, you will put the earphones and you will hear my voice talking in Chinese with my tone in real time. So, now, in those schools, what are we doing? What do we teach? This is a question, because I don't know. They don't have generally technology programs. So most of them are not trained to interact with the large language models to improve. So what, and this is will go, now I ask myself, I am in a computer science department also, and what we do is to teach students how to program. I'm not sure it will be useful in a few years. You can understand that. This is going to be a, a major change that is not happening in five years, in 20 years, but probably in five years. So what do we do? How we change a computer science department and the training? So I think the only things that I have to say is that, you know, what you have learned as a PhD student, however, is the most important value. You know how to face a problem search for a solution, solution and 
think. This is what you, and this is why I say the life uh, long learning process, because I think that we have all to abandon this idea that we get to a terminal degree and then we do that. We will have to reinvent ourselves so fast and so quickly in the future that this is a major ch challenge also for university. But we need again to lead in that. We need to abandon, we will need to abandon the old structure. We were talking before, you know, about what we do with the disciplinary sectors, uh, with, uh, with the silos of academia. We need to dismantle all that because it's not going to work. We will need computer scientists in, a, in language uh, and humanities and vice versa. So I, the fact that we cannot yet do that higher this way is what then has an impact on the students, on the way you are educated, et cetera, et cetera. So I, but I don't have a solution. You know, this is something that will get us to a disruptive point at a certain point. Unfortunately, now very quickly. Okay. Uh, Hoping, I hope I interpreted your questions in the right way. I have a question from uh, our rector. No, no, I, I, I would like to, to follow this, I mean, last, the last sentences, because we are discussing about it before, but now it is, the topic is arising because, uh, you know, we have different constraints. One is, I mean, arising from the history. Uh, the history has defined and declined the different disciplines. There are some rectory building in which we have physics, uh, I mean, uh, theology, and all the disciplines, I mean, arising from the history. So we have another level of constraints that is about the uh, regulation. So how uh, the disciplines and the academic is, uh, environment is regulated. And then we have the, I mean, the regulation we, we set in, uh, in the uh, universities. Uh, we could find a way to set in a different way, uh, the, the, for instance, the PhD program. So, so my question is simple. What are your suggestions in order to, I mean, uh, foster and support a, a change in the direction of the interdisciplinarity? If you have suggestions in this respect. I, you know, that that is what I was. We were discussing a bit before. You know, I'm 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 the director of a research institute that is interdisciplinary. It lives uh, uh, horizontally through ten different colleges, and thus from communication and political uh, scientists and political scientists to. Uh, hard uh, foundational uh, mathematicians going through physicists, uh, uh, statisticians, uh, uh, engineers, uh, computer scientists, etc. Uh, I I don't have a suggestion in the sense that I have uh, an, an implementation that is basically a constant fight uh, to go over the barriers that the system builds around around you how you hire a person that works you know is is a computer scientist but works uh, uh, for instance in political science how you hire a person like this one in in a place like as it's we invented positions that are you know we don't have the sector and the codes etc so we could do interdisciplinary appointments half and half but this still it's not enough i think in italy is even worse because it's one code one thing we need to go over that because it's it will not be like that in the future it's not going to be now i have I'm pretty sure you have those situations. Perhaps you have a brilliant scientist who is a computer scientist, but perhaps works on uh, population mapping. And he has published in Nature and Science, but he doesn't have the paper in the conference, uh, in the computer science conference uh, things. How you hire it? You know, generally, you find big oppositions, but at the same time, the people in the how to say, population studies, uh, which are in a different departments like health sciences or uh, will tell you, well, but this guy is not an expert, doesn't have a PhD in this and that. Come on. 
I think, uh, you know, as you were saying, uh, Rector, uh, is once the PhD was just a PhD, there was not even attached uh, the idea that, you know, we are all PhD. We are philosophy doctor. We are not, you know, that was the idea. So we need to go back and, and I, I think do some step back from the parcelization that we, ha we have done in the last few years, uh, thinking that this parcelization was a solution. Probably this is not the solution and we need to, few, to do a few steps back. But I don't, you know, that what I imagine is mostly build those horizontal places. Uh, institutes, uh, PhD programs, uh, um, I don't know, advanced training program, uh, nationally, I, I don't know, things uh, which start to put a glue across departments uh, and, uh, and uh, colleges and schools, etc., in a way that generates a, a much more well-rounded uh, uh, class of uh, of, of experts, but it's it's an uphill fight, uh, that's for sure. Um, thank you very much Francesco. for your presentation. Uh, my name is Francesco Frati. I'd like to make a comment on uh, data. Uh, some, some, somehow building on uh, the last student's question, he started by saying that um, um, if we have enough data or something that, like that. In, in, in different disciplines, it's always difficult to decide in advance when the data are enough. And, uh, and that's one of the uh, difficult issues. Uh, let me make a couple of examples from the disciplines that I know better. I'm a, zoologi a zoologist. I study animals. But I use a lot of molecular biology as a source of data to study my um, animals. Uh, and I find two large differences. This comment may be useful for those who are not in the life science uh, field, who are approaching the life science, maybe to contribute with uh, modeling or building algorithms or whatsoever. In zoology, uh, we miss a lot of data. We, we all feel that uh, we should collect more data, more data, more data. New species, uh, uh, new populations, uh, uh, new characters uh, within species uh, to study the evolution of populations, new uh, uh, um, uh, biochemical patterns within the species uh, to study their behavior, their physiology, and whatsoever. Uh, I feel that in molecular biology we have the, uh, you know, the other way around. Especially in the last uh, 20 years, the amount of data that was able to uh, be collected is uh, enormous. I, 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 I'm old enough uh, to remember when uh, um, uh, collecting, the, collecting a piece of DNA sequence was uh, almost a nightmare and it costs a lot of money and a lot of time just to understand uh, and study you know, a piece of uh, two or three hundred of base pairs. But now the amount of data is huge, is huge. And uh, uh, what we actually need uh, is the tools to extract the information from those data. Whether these tools are models or these tools are uh, uh, um, um, algorithms or these tools are machines which have enough uh, uh, computing capability to extract the information from those data. So, in different fields, you have different uh, uh, situations about the data. In, in many fields, uh, you still have to collect a lot of data. In other fields, uh, it's quite easy to collect the data. And, 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 and in the previous fields, uh, sometimes collecting the data is kind of difficult. But in the other fields, you have uh, huge amount of data and what you really need uh, is the tools to extract the information which uh, are of interest for us. At the end of it, let me say that uh, I am a great fan of data and I'm a great fan of conclusions based uh, on, on, on the data. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Uh, this is a great comment. Uh, I, I just want to add one thing. I, it's very difficult to say when we have enough too, too much or, or too few data. The problem is really to have a question. The question is, do we have the data we need? Because in many cases, it's not what we need. And now, in places where you can do lab experiment, et cetera, you can generate the data you want. But for, for instance, uh, in, in public health, this is not the case. And also in many social sciences, because really we, we are not always in the position to get the data we, we want. So I give you just a simple example, uh, again, of data. You know, we have been asked uh, in the last uh, 15 years to do major initiative to do those forecasts of influenza season. But there is no data that tells you how many people are actually, what is the ground truth, what, how many people are uh, really sick with influenza. Because we are not testing. We are testing only 10% of the people and the one that's generally have are at, are at risk. So we have all indirect measure. So if I tell you, well, what do we want to understand about the flu burden? Because this is a, is a problem for, 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 for the healthcare system. What they give us is to forecast those influenza-like illness signal. Just to tell you something, if we would be in weather forecast, it's like to say, you want to do the forecast for the temperature, but the actual signal that we see is the, your energy bill on, uh, uh, from a selected number of households. Obviously, the energy bill on the selected number of households is correlated to the temperature but it's not the temperature. And so you can get all the energy bills in the house and have even too much of those data, but not yet have enough data for what is your original question. And so this is a little bit the problem. From time to time, it's not just the amount of data, but what kind of data. If uh, I don't see other questions, but probably I can have one <laughs> just to exploit a bit uh, your ex expertise uh, and uh, in the role you you had and you have uh, in the public opinion regarding the pandemic, and um, uh, I see, but I would like to have a confirmation from you that uh, we have a, a sort of Asian model to tackle of the pandemic. The idea is uh, tracing as much as possible. In contrast, uh, in, in Italy and uh, in, in other uh, European countries, you have uh, another approach. The approach is uh, lockdown and, and so on. We have uh, also some strange things in Italy at the very beginning of the pandemic. And uh, in my view, but I don't know exactly, uh, the uh, Asian model uh, was uh, the, the, the best one. But uh, is it, uh, in your opinion, possible to, have, uh, to adopt uh, such a model giving our cultural, legal, and also technological problem in comparing what uh, happened in Korea or Taiwan and so on at the time. Since I, I think that uh, this is uh, also uh, something useful for, for the future, unfortunately. I, well, that's, uh, that's a major, uh, major issue that uh, links the work and science uh, to the uh, policy making. Uh, that is another major uh, junction point. Uh, what, what do you do when, when you have science and scientific insight and then there are policies? Uh, first of all, uh, uh, I think uh, basically in all places in the world that uh, there was some prime minister, uh, uh, president of the country, etc., that was going uh, on TV declaring that they were following the science. No, that was the mantra that was. Uh, well, if you do that, uh, you're doing the wrong things as a policymaker. You don't want to follow the science. You get informed on the science, and then you have to do the decision making. The decision making is another process that uh, stems from a lot of other things, including economical trade-off, cultural trade-off, value proposition. So it's not 
the science that have to say, you know, there is a simple thing. During a pandemic, you could say every life has a kind of infinite value. And so the quantity I want to minimize is the number of deaths. Well, at that point, you have a simple strategy that is the one really to close everything in the house uh, until you have zero cases, you test everybody, you know, all the, the yeah, zero, Z zero, 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 zero. But at the same time, you know that doing that, you destroy the economy, you have collateral damages of all possible kinds, etc. So perhaps you can say, well, no, I prefer, you know, I prefer much more debts, but a working economy. And then the solution to your problem is completely different. The policy implementation is completely different. And this is a value proposition. It's not is a political view, is a cultural view. So it's, it's you know, you don't follow the, 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 the science passively as a policymaker, but you are informed by science with respect to the decision you want to make. In some Asian countries, not all of them, by the way, but we are talking about South Korea, Japan, etc. There was uh, an approach that was uh, that was an approach that was stemming from the fact that they have a, a social uh, structure that is much less individualistic than uh, than the Europeans and Western world. Because I know how they did the, the contact tracing, how they did the, 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 their approach. And this is extremely invasive. So we were not even using the app uh, for the contact notifications. Actually, they had a bracelet that if you were, uh, if you were uh, infectious, uh, you had to, to wear every day so that you cannot go off the house uh, without the control of people. And if you were going out of your house, there was policemen coming to your place. So, but you know, in, in those societies, that approach is, is not because just, uh, it's, it's it's really reductionism to say because those are dictatorship or things like that. It's not like that. It's a different. They have a collective perspective on society for which you give up a certain freedom in order for the collective behavior, in order for, uh, to, to, to improve the collective behavior. In our case, it was impossible. Then we have to choose uh, and do trade off uh, with economics. I was always, I would say, uh, all the debate about we should close everything or not is a fake debate. First of all, nobody closed everything uh, <laughs> in a way that was minimizing. Everybody was talking about minimizing debts. That has never been the, 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 the target. Uh, I, I, let's be honest. You know, we want to minimize the debts. No. The things was to keep the things at a level that the, the healthcare system was not overwhelmed. But it's a very understandable decision. Let's do we were not, as scientists, providing scenarios or evaluation or assessment based on our own perspective. Everything that we provided was triggered by specific question of the policy makers. So that's, that's where I think there were this, this junction. And uh, for sure, if you think about certain indicators, the Asian approach is better. If you think about other indicators, it might be, I would say, other, other intermediate, uh, intermediate approaches depending on, 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 on where you want to go. I think there is something else. A pandemic should be always faced more in a collective way, not just in a single country. But for instance, the fact that the European Union was never able to generate a common policy was a major issue. The United States were not able to accept for four weeks to have a common policy. These are obviously are disruptive in, in something that has no border. So all that are, uh, are, are major uh, disconnection with the policy making and lack of transparency and accountability that I think have put the scientific community, all of us, in a difficult position, often fighting each other, you know, so many fights among economists, medical doctors, epidemiologists on what to do, what not to do, and uh, you are too extreme, not too extreme, etc. Why all that was a fake 
discussion because actually the policy makers instead they were following value proposition that were coming from politics and vision so unfortunately <laughs> so thank you to everybody thank you all once again okay <laughs> no, no, i mean it is uh, i would like to take this 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 point in the final slide um, because the final slides of uh, our our uh, speaker keynote speaker this afternoon is i mean uh, i mean uh, a good assist for us because i mean uh, it's in your hands the opportunity to to uh, move the research uh, where i mean your passion is is able to to go and in particular, uh, I mean, uh, we believe that you could move your research in the high risk research. A uh, few months ago, we launched our uh, um, research development plan of the university. One of the major, and we are going to, to, to work on it, it is called New Frontier. So, we have, I mean, a small amount, I mean, extremely lower than the amounts they have in, in the Northeastern University. But we have a small amount of funds will be devoted on the high-risk research. So we expect that uh, you are able to, to invest your time in uh, high-risk research. Uh, and uh, we, in a few weeks, uh, are going to launch this part of the uh, research development plan in order to fund such kind of research because it is the research that is related to uh, the great challenges and uh, your patients. So uh, stay, stay tuned with us and uh, this is what we would like to, to develop in, in our university. Thank you. Thank you. quanti sono